man compiles the dictionary of chimpanzee language. Cinderella did not wear a glass slipper. A cross of gold brings disaster to many men. Can you imagine that? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is Lindsay McCurry speaking. I'm back with my charts and another collection of odd and sensational facts with which to regale you for a while. In just one minute and a half, we'll all be back with the proof of the statements made a moment ago. So wait for us, will you please? That's a strange noise, isn't it? But don't be alarmed. No one here has suddenly gone to chasing imaginary dinosaurs around the studio. What you heard was Charles Fuller saying he's glad to see us. And who is Charles Fuller? Well, according to a newspaper of March 6, 1915, Charles Fuller was a chimpanzee who could talk so that his owner, E.W. Knowlton of Pasadena, California, could understand him. Can you imagine that? Said Mr. Knowlton when interviewed. I have lately been making a dictionary of the words I found Fuller uses. So far, I have found six distinct words. And no doubt there are others, but these six I have identified positively. Each one is said on precisely the same sort of occasion. I think this proves that monkeys of the higher orders can converse among themselves. Uh, that they can think is already proved. <laughs> but uh, listen for yourself. Fuller? Fuller? Mm. 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 Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that means he's hungry. He wants something to eat. <laughs> and that wasn't all Charles Fuller would say. Here are a couple more of the phrases in his vocabulary. <laughs> that, according to Mr. Knowlton, meant I am afraid. And then? <laughs> in chimpanzees, that is go away and don't bother me. We have Mr. Knowlton's word that Charles Fuller could sew, untie knots, and untwist a swing when the rope got tangled up. But other chimps have done that before. What made Charles Fuller unique was the fact that his vocabulary could be understood by his owner. Can you imagine that? Well, now comes the time for our fairy tale class. Today's story is that of Cinderella and the fur slipper. Pardon, and... teacher. Glass slipper. Uh, fur slipper. Glass. It's still fur, and I'll prove it for you. Glass. All right, sit in the corner, and I'll explain. You see, the story of Cinderella is of French origin. When the translator took the story and began his work of translation, he made a very odd but still a natural mistake for anyone not working in his native language. In the original French version, the slipper is referred to as pantouflon vert, meaning a slipper made of fur. V-A-I-R is the French word for fur. The translator was more familiar with the actual sound of the word vert than he was with its meaning. He wrote the word down as V-E-R-R-E, -E, meaning glass. So we today, because of a translator's odd mistake, know the pretty little fairy tale as Cinderella and the Glass Slipper instead of Cinderella and the Fur Slipper. Can you imagine that? Well, there are countless stories about the evil that follows famous jewels, about the bad luck they bring to each uh, successive owner. The Hope Diamond, for instance, has a history crowded with deaths of tragic episodes in the lives of its owners. Along that line, I dug up a story that has all the character of melodramatic fiction with the added punch of being true. From a newspaper dated July 8, 1929, comes an item saying that the curse of the cross has been set at rest. The cross is really the mount of the Holy Cross that nestles in the heart of the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And the curse? Well, listen to this. 
In 1873, members of the Hayden Geological Survey Party were exploring in that particular region of the Rockies. As they went on, they became more and more awed by the grim grandeur of the scene before them. And then, suddenly... Wait! Wait down there! Uh, what's the matter? Look! What? Look at that. Just look at it. Why, a mountain must be over 10,000 feet. Oh, easily. But that isn't what I mean. Look at the side of it. That cross. Yes, I see it. Why, it runs the entire length of the mountain. The stem must be a crevice. And a cross piece up near the top is another crevice. But just imagine, a gigantic cross over 10,000 feet high. Why, it's... Uh, wait, look. Here is the foot of the cross. What does this look like? Look like? Why, it's gold. This is... This is literally a cross of gold. <laughs> The geologists stood at the foot of the great cross, awed by its mighty size. Perhaps they felt something of the intangible majesty of the unknown as they gazed at this masterpiece of nature. They reported the discovery of the mountain and also of the gold to be found there. Then, in 1879, two prospectors named Farley and Smith staked out a claim at the foot of the cross. Hey, Smith! Smith! Come here! Yeah? What's the matter, Farley? Say, this place has got enough gold in it to set us up for life and then some. Look at it! Yeah, Say, I've been a-wondering about the stories we hear about this place. Some folks say it's, it's sacred or something like that. Sure, I hear them too, but gold ain't sacred. And there's plenty of it here for the taking. Oh, come on, now pitch in, give me a hand. We'll clear the rubble away and then start digging in earnest. Why, this whole cross is filled with gold. Come on! But did they get a chance to get the gold out? Suddenly, Smith and Farley fell ill of a mysterious malady which the doctor could not diagnose. Unable to work their claim, the prospectors hired two men, Johnson and Olson, to dig the claim for them. Then, one day, the two hired men were out on a little lake, rowing. Hey! We better get back to land! Looks like this storm is coming up faster than we thought! Look out, Olson! The boat! It's there! Both men were drowned in the sudden squall that overturned their tiny boat. Farley and Smith went back to working their claim back to the business of taking the precious ore from the cross of gold on the mountainside. Then one day, while they were at their cabin... How much we get out today, Farley? I... Hey, what are you watching out the window? I don't know. Thought I saw something moving in the brush over there. I... Smith! Indians! Oh! Farley! Farley! Farley was killed. Smith escaped and went to Australia. Even going to another country didn't save him from the weird curse of doom that hung over him, for he was killed in a mine explosion. In succeeding years, the cross brought tragedy, disaster, or death to every man who scarred his sides in search of gold. Then on July 8, 1929, the Mount of the Holy Cross in Colorado was made a national monument of the United States. The glittering yellow metal lies in the cross protected from men, or perhaps men are protected from it. Who knows? And now for the musical portion of this, can you imagine that? I wonder how many of you remember that famous old song, Under the Bamboo Tree. Of course you do. It's an exceedingly hard song to forget once you hear its catchy tune, the lively sparkling lyrics, and the toe-tingling swing of its rhythm. But if you remember the song, I wonder if you remember the story of how it was written. Just in case you don't, here it is. It was written, you may recall, by two gifted Negroes, Bob Cole and Rosamond Johnson. But how? Well, it seems that Cole and Johnson were walking uptown one evening in New York... Johnson was humming as Bob Cole turned to him and spoke. Say, uh, Rosamond, uh, you know, that's the song we need for our new act. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, you don't, Bob. We're not going to desecrate a sacred song that way. We simply can't use it in our act. It, it's more than just a song to me, Bob. Somehow it typifies our whole race. Oh, I know that, but uh, listen to me. Uh, you went to the Boston Conservatory, didn't you? Well, what's that got to do with a new song for our act? Oh, a whole lot. Well, you should be able to take that song and change the melody a little and set the rhythm up a little and have a new song. All right. Mm -hmm. I'll try it. Yep, I'll try it. Good. Inspired by the grand old spiritual, Rosamond Johnson set to work on the melody for a new song. Finally, he finished it. Its first title was If You Lack a Me, but when Cole and Johnson presented it to a music publisher, it was suggested that the title be changed to Under the Bamboo Tree. Then the two sang it for Miss Marie Cahill, who liked it instantly.
But when she insisted that it be incorporated into the show Nancy Brown, another snag was hit, for said the composer of Nancy Brown. What? Put that in my show? Never, never. I'll not have my score ruined by that, that, that... Well, I refuse to call it a song. But the lively Miss Cahill, who knew a hit when she heard it, calmly put her dainty foot down and said the song went in or she went out. <laughs> the song went in. And so out of the past, out of a race in whom music and love of it is born, came Under the Bamboo Tree. In the jungles lived the maid Of royal blood or dusky shade A marked impression once she made Upon a Zulu from Matabulu And every morning he would be Down underneath the bamboo tree Awaiting there his love to see And then to her he'd sing You like a me, like I like a you, and we like a both the same. I like a say this very day, I like a change your name. Cause I love you and love you too, and if you love a me, one live is two, two live is one, under the bamboo tree. And in this simple jungle way, he wooed the maiden every day by singing what he had to say. One day he seized her and gently squeezed her. And then beneath the bamboo green, he begged her to become his queen. The dusky maiden blushed unseen and joined him in his song. If you like a me, like I like a you, and we like a both the same, I like a say this very day, I like a change your name, cause I love you and love you too, and if you love me, one live is two, two live is one, under the bamboo tree. Well, now it's time to turn you back to your own announcer. And until we get together again for another session of Can You Imagine That? This is Lindsay McCary saying goodbye now. Thank you.